waiting for you to break into some of your dance moves because I've seen them <laughs> offline. I know you've got them. So yeah, thanks for doing that. We are in a series called Gritty Relationships where we're looking at a few episodes of Jesus' life and how he interacted with his relationships, friendships, and how he stuck with them for the long haul, for eternity. That's why he came, but also in the moment, how he changed. And so today we're going to deal with disappointment. And I, I heard a funny story to introduce the concept of disappointment this morning, a harmless, funny little story. So Chelsea, on our worship team, we had a Bunko Woman's Night on Friday night, and she got it all organized. And some people that RSVP'd, and if it's you, just deal with this little story. You didn't show. You RSVP'd. And so Chelsea was a little disappointed. They had to do something else. They couldn't even play Bunko. And as she was going through the evening, she realized that one of the people that RSVP'd that wasn't there, she was supposed to pick up, <laughs> and she forgot. <laughs> so who disappointed whom? <laughs> Proper grammar used there. So that's kind of what we're hitting on tonight, or this morning, is about disappointment. So the question that I wanted to think about right off is, when was the last time someone disappointed you? Think about that for a moment. Someone disappointed you. When was the last time? Let's um, switch that up. When was the last time you disappointed someone? When was that? Then, what happened next? Whether you were the disappointed or you were the disappointer, what happened next? Because what disappointment is, it, it's just really hard to recover from, depending on, on what it is. Uh, it's complicated. There's many things to unpack when you get disappointed, but it's complicated because what disappointment is, is in its simplest form, is a missed appointment. That's what it is. It is a failed appointment. So it can be a missed appointment because you have bad calendar skills. I'm, I do that. Some of you have been subject to that, where I just need to actually look at it. Quit smirking at me. <laughs> Stood him up last Saturday morning, so there's like, mm. But she's full of grace, and I, it just happens. You, you, here's the tip. If you make an appointment in your calendar, look at your calendar. Yeah, there's like two parts, two parts. So maybe it's that. Maybe it's a missed appointment because of neglect, and you just feel neglected by people. You don't feel like a priority. Maybe it's because avoidance. They're avoiding you for some reason. You're avoiding them for some reason. Maybe you're, it's just disregard. Maybe it's an appointment that you made with someone that they didn't even know you made. You know what I mean by that? So it wasn't like a calendar thing. It's just that you painted a picture of how your relationship was going to be, and you made an appointment of how they were going to respond, and you're going to be close friends or something like that, and they didn't step up because they didn't even have it on their calendar because they didn't even know. You made the appointment. They didn't agree to the appointment, but yet we can get disappointed about that. And the impact of a disappointing relationship or a relationship that, where you become disappointed in something that person did, it's alienation, isn't it? It's a fracture. It's a fracture in the relationship. And so we have an opportunity today to learn about how looking at Jesus' example of how he dealt with what could have been super disappointing in his relationship with Peter and, and how he handled that. Because if we don't get over our disappointment sooner or if we don't get over our disappointment better, then I, have, I say we have this trail of what I call skeleton friendships, whether it's just the skeletons of friends along the pathway of your life. And I know you're thinking of some right now that are skeleton friendships. How can we not have skeleton friendships and how can we have gritty relationships with people? So Jesus dealt with disappointment, still does, when he deals with me, probably when he deals with you. That's why he died, because of those disappointments called sin. But even among his circle, his posse, his closest friends, his disciples, I think he got disappointed. And even among the, the tighter group of which Peter was one of them, I'm pretty sure that if there was an opportunity for Jesus to be disappointed, it was in this story, not actually the text that we're unpacking today, but I want to read about the disappointing thing that happened between Jesus and Peter from Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 54. Then they, the people coming after Jesus, seized him and led him away. This is after he had gone into the garden and asked his disciples, his posse, to pray for him, and they fell asleep. Hmm. Maybe he was already disappointed, going on with that. So they brought him to the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. So his guy, one of his closest, was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, all these people, Peter sat among them. 
Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looking closely at him, said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Uh, Yeah, this man was also with him. Then he denied it. Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Uh, And after, probably with that little accent, and after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too was a Galilean. He had an accent. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So, did you catch verse 21? And the Lord Jesus turned and looked at Peter. He just got done denying him three times, as he said, and he turned and looked at him. I wonder what that look was like. You know, the the look of Jesus' face as Peter was doing what he said he would do. Look at disappointment. You know, like we can get Uh, a look of disbelief. Are you serious? A look of disgust. You know, furring up your brow, your whole face is all crinkled up, disgust. How could you do that to me? Maybe it was different. Maybe because he was God and he was full of grace and he was about to die full of grace. It was a look of hope, not a wrinkled up face. Maybe it was a, a look of, I know, Peter, you didn't mean to do that. Maybe it was a look of forgiveness. Maybe it was a gaze of grace. Maybe it was a combination of the disappointing thing and the, the grace thing. I don't know, but shortly after that look, however it may have looked on Jesus' face, Jesus was taken away, he was humiliated, he was flogged, and he was murdered. And we just don't know if Peter was there for any of that because he ran away. It says he ran away. After that look, maybe he just couldn't face Jesus. They said in the, in the scriptures we read that there were people at the foot of the cross, some of the disciples, but it never says that Peter was one of them. He may have been, but maybe he was so <clears throat> disappointed in himself that he couldn't even be around Jesus. And when he ran, he really ran and hid until the women came to him because it says they were hiding And they said, Jesus is not there. He has risen from the dead. And then Peter started having interactions. So we know that they talked again, that Peter and Jesus talked. And this was after Jesus was dead, after he was victorious over sin and death. And our Bibles tell us that at least four times they talked. Luke 24, if you want to write these down, you can look it up. Luke 24, they talked. Matthew 28, they talked. John 20, they talked, and then in a moment, as I read for you in John 21. So there was probably in Luke 24 at least one one one-on-one talk before the talk that we have today where Jesus and Peter talked one-on-one. I wonder how hard that was because you know when you have this disappointing thing, someone disappoints you, and they come to you like Jesus came to Peter, and you have to face them, and that first really awkward, what am I going to say? Is he mad? I wonder if that's what it was like. So we don't know about that first conversation that was probably one on, but we do have a conversation that was the next conversation. It was a public conversation around a fire, which is a really good opportunity. Men like to talk around fires, and I'm going to start to read that to you in several different parts. So we're now going to be in John 21, and that's where we'll stay for the rest of the morning. John 21, 1 through 5. So after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of the disciples were all together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. So we're going to stop there for now. So the first thing that we can learn about how Jesus dealt with disappointment and how we can deal with it ourselves, in ourselves or in others, is Jesus will invite us to re-engage the purpose he has for us. Jesus will invite us to re-engage the purpose that he has for us, whether it's our relationship with someone else or our relationship with him. So at the beginning of this chapter, there's a gap between the conversations that Jesus had had with the disciples because it starts... Our verse started with after this. So the after this that it's talking about is conversations they'd already had. 
in Matthew 28, particularly, Jesus is fully glorified. He has risen from the dead. He's meeting up with his disciples. But it says, I'm going to go away from you in chapter 28, verse 16. And he says, meet up with me up in the mountain, at the foot of the mountain, up in the north region. So that's up kind of where Jesus' headquarters was, up north of the Sea of Galilee. So some time had passed, and they said, Jesus said, go from here, from Jerusalem, go up there. It's about a three days walk. So at least three days had passed since they'd interacted with Jesus. So Peter, that list that we just read, they went up there to that region. And then what does Peter say? I'm going to go fishing. He was a fisherman before Jesus commissioned him, recommissioned him, reappointed him to be fishers of men for their souls, and he decided that he was going to go fishing instead. And some people put Peter down for this. Like, Jesus said, you're going to be my disciple, and he goes, uh, I quit. I'm going to go back to being a fisherman. I'm going to go back. Maybe he was quitting. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But he was just going back to kind of catch his breath. The most significant week of their life up to that point had just happened. They thought Jesus was going to rule the kingdom, and he was dead, and they were hiding, and now he's alive, and they don't know what to do with all that. So they had to stop and catch their emotional breath. And I think that's one quick pause for us, is that when we're disappointed in ourselves or in someone else, sometimes we need to catch our breath and don't make decisions. We need to catch what our breath we all need to slow down a little bit and realistically take restock, to recalibrate our own selves about what we did to contribute to the disappointment, what we can do to repair the disappointment, whether it's my fault or not, to just take a breath, not make any decisions, and catch yourself and go fishing. Do what you do. And that's what, what Peter did. So I am willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that he wasn't quitting on Jesus here. He was just processing this disappointment. So while they were waiting for Jesus to show up for the appointment Jesus made, he said, go to the mountain, I'll see you there. He wasn't there yet. So they stayed active. They weren't hiding anymore. They weren't feeling bad. They got up and they got active. They were recovering from this hard week because what they thought they were living for had all changed. It was all different. And he said, I'm going to go fishing. So when we feel like someone's let us down, and particularly maybe, dare you say, Jesus let you down, We need to wait for him, catch our breath, not make rash decisions, and let him reactivate us. And while we're waiting for him to reactivate us, we need to stay active in something. So when you feel disappointed, whether you're the disappointing one or you're the disappointed one, what do you usually fill your time with? Do you sit and stew and get a wrinkled face? Do you just nail gaze? Do you feel bad? Do you put a drama king or a drama queen crown on and get all dramatic and start making the stories bigger than they were? Do you castigate your own self? Oh, whoa, whoa, I'm so bad. I'm such a bad, bad man. So bad. Do you feel hurt? Do you have feelings? Do you feel confused? Do you feel mad? Do you feel bitter? The the open palm of hope versus the clenched fist of bitterness? We need to take a hot minute to reset when we're disappointed. But one way to do that, instead of brooding, you know what brooding actually is? I was thinking about this. Brooding is when you're trying to, like, that's what chickens do to hatch something. Instead of brooding over your disappointment so it hatches into bitterness, do something different and move on to what Jesus has for you. Because if we get active and take our mind off of those things, then that gives us openness, so it gives us an opportunity to start thinking about forgiving people, forgiving ourselves for what we did. So that's what I think Peter and his disciples did. They got up, they went, they went fishing. They went out and they trusted Jesus to show up for his appointment, which he's about to do, because he has something special in store for all of them, especially for Peter. So when they got there, they decided to do something and they went fishing to do something that they knew how to do, but it didn't go so well. Did you catch that? Zero. No fish. But it was there and at that time that Jesus showed up and met with them. He showed up and started to reappoint them. So let me read the next section, 6 through 10. He said to them, this is Jesus shouting from the shore, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Because he just, you got any fish? No. Switch. Switch sides. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, so that's John, Therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. 
When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some fish that you have just caught. So Jesus will tweak our efforts and not dismantle them. So when we disappoint Jesus, and we can do this with each other too, Jesus will tweak our efforts but not dismantle them. So did you see what, what happened there? There's, there's, this is such a rich story. He instructed them to move their nets seven and a half feet. So that's like maybe from here to there, maybe? Fish, no fish here, seven and a half feet, more than they could haul in. It was their boat, it was their net, it was their effort. He just tweaked it a little bit. You get it? Seven and a half feet, that's all it was. And then Peter, in, in full drama king fashion, freaks out, oh! And he puts on like a robe, which is really weird because he's 100 yards off. It was like probably like a robe of lamb's wool. So picture jumping into 100 yards off of the shore with lamb's wool, and he's trying to swim or trudge through. He's just being all Peter-like, impulsive, running up to Jesus. And he gets to the shore, and there's a fire, and there's a grill, and there's already fish there. Did you catch? This is subtle. Sometimes we miss these cool things in Scripture. And he says, hey, bring some of your fish and add to it. He had already, he made fish. He created fish. He's that Jesus is God. He's the creator. But he took their catch, their efforts, their labor, and added to what he had already prepared for them. You get what I'm saying? He takes what he has, combines it with what we bring to the table, and does something. You all bring something to God's table. He created you with purposes his purposes. You bring things to the table, what God wants to accomplish around you and what God wants to accomplish in you. You bring fish to the table. It reminds me of a, a verse in Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 10. I think we have it up on the screen. There it is. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that he, that we, would walk in them. Workmanship, it, you've heard this before. It's a great word. It, it's like a, a work of art. For we are his work of art. So you might think like, oh, what kind of painting am I? Like a painting to hang in the museum for people to stare at? Mm -mm, it's not that kind of work of art for people to notice us. No, it says what we're created for. Not to be looked at, but to do good works that God planned and put in place. He already has fish on the fire. And he's inviting you to add to it. Things that he created you to do, he's already got in motion. The fire has started, the fish are frying, and he asks you to add what you bring to the table to it. Even things like that we think are terrible. Romans 8, 28, one of the best verses around for me. It's one of my life verses. All things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. All things. So you know what that means? Even when I disappoint God. Even when I sin against God, God never designed sin for us. God will never say, yeah, go ahead and move towards sin. Never, ever. Write that down. Never, ever will God say, yeah, go ahead and move towards sin because you feel so bad and you feel so disappointed. Never does he do that. But he takes those things, all things, even your disappointments to him, even your sin, and works them for his purpose. So one side note before we move on, just a little interesting thing, just a little gift for you. The text goes on to say that they caught 153 fish. Sometimes you think, what? 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 Why? Why tell us how many fish? So I just want to throw out something for you to think because God's so, so good, and sometimes it's just nice. It might seem strange to have that detail in there, but one practical, pragmatic thing to think about is they were taxed on fish, on the number of fish, and Jesus had said to them prior in all his integrity, he said, give to Caesar what Caesar's. So even though it's like this thing we're going to be doing here, we're going to eat a bunch of it, count them so that you can have integrity and pay your taxes. Maybe it was that, but that, I stumbled upon this other interesting thing that is kind of cool. Maybe it's the reason, maybe not, but it's just kind of cool to think about. So a church father, uh, a few hundred years after this happened, his name is St. Jerome, did some research. And he summarized, he theorized that at that time when they were catching, when Jesus was alive with flesh, that there were 153 known species of fish. 
So you know what Jesus was trying to say? Be fishers of all men, all species of us, all humans. It's kind of cool. He's just including us in that. We're part of the, the 153 fish. So interesting side note. I don't know if you find that interesting. I thought it was kind of cool that he's just being inclusive for all of us to offer salvation through Jesus to all of us. So let's review our first two points. Jesus will invite us to re-engage the purpose he has for us. He will tweak our efforts and not dismantle them. And then let's look at another one as we look at chapter 21, 15 through 17. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The fish, the disciples... Your old job, your new job, not super relevant. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time. I don't know how much time had passed in between. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Same question. He said to him, tend my sheep. Oh, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So Jesus turns disappointment into reappointment. Jesus turns disappointment into reappointment. So this is the third encounter, probably the third of four encounters that Peter's having with Jesus. And it's this heart-to-heart talk right in front of the, a fire, which is a great conversational place for men. Men always have good conversations around a fire. But it was a public conversation that was going on. The other disciples were hearing this. So Jesus gets to the heart of the matter, to the heart of the disappointment, to the heart of the betrayal. And he asked him three times. I think there's so much, there's three different things in this section that we're going to unpack. We're spending a few more minutes there. So let's talk about the first thing, the word love. So in the Bible, there's different types of love. There is... um, a love called eros, a love called storgy, a love called phileo, and a love called agape. So let me explain them. Um, eros is for marriage, erotic, sexual love. Storgy is like family adoration. You know, like the love you have for your kids that you just, you just have it, love you have for your nieces, nephews, grandkids, your wife, your husband. It's just, it's just that. There's phileo, which is like a friendship adoration, a friendship affection, the affection among friends. And there's agape, which is a selfless love, sacrificial love. The love that Jesus has for us, the love that hung him on the cross and died for our sins. So which love do you think is being used here? Well, there's a couple. Which love do you think Jesus is using here? Jesus uses agape love every time. It's definitely not eros, and it's not the storge family love, even though you might think the whole family aspect of Christianity of Jesus, his family, beyond his family. It's not that, though. It's the agape love. What about Peter? What um, love do you think Peter used? It was phileo love. It was that friend affection. The, so the first question, Jesus says, do you agape love me? He says, you know that I friend love you, Jesus. I friend love you. He goes, okay. So he asked the second time, Peter, do you love me? Agape, love me. Selfless, love me. He goes, Jesus, man, I friend love you. I have friend affection for you, Jesus. Third time, you know what happens here? Jesus switches. It's kind of like he takes the fish, takes what Peter brings to the table and works with it because Jesus says, okay, do you phileo love me? And Peter says, yeah. You know everything. You know I phileo love you. Why did Jesus do that? I think it's because that's where Peter was at that time. He was saying, okay, I'll take your fish. I'm frying up something bigger, agape stuff here. You're not ready for it, I understand. So I'll take your phileo and I'm going to up it. I'm going to make it agape love. I'll take what you bring to the table and I'm going to make it bigger and better. That's cool to think about. But that's he's taking what I bring to the table, that's not what Jesus has yet. But he's going to do something, make it bigger and better. So that's one thing in that conversation. There's a, a next thing, is why did Jesus ask him three times? What do you think? Any, any takers? Why did he do it three times? 
Uh, many times did he betray? Most people think it's because of that. It, it probably was to try to cancel out all three failures, to try to cancel out all three disappointment for Peter's sake, not for Jesus' sake. Jesus had already forgiven him. He had already died for his sins and mine and yours. So sometimes when we disappoint God, when we disappoint each other in our relationships, aren't we our own worst critics? Sometimes I am. Man, I am a master castigator. I'm just beating myself on the back with emotional whips. I'm such a bad man, bad pastor, all those kinds of things. Sometimes we are the hardest on ourselves and we cannot forgive ourselves. Sometimes we just have a hard time moving on from our mistakes. We just do sometimes. So as I say that, what comes to mind for you? That sin that's just too much, that you can't forgive yourself for. Do you know what we're doing when we do that? when we cling to those things that we've done, we're saying, Jesus, you dying on the cross was not good enough because I am so bad. No, he died for that sin. Do not place yourself on the cross. That was Jesus' job, God's job, and he did that. So, see, Jesus wants to affect your Mondays. We say that all the time here at Journey Church. Not just your eternity, with God, but your Monday so that we can move on from those sins, so that we can move on from those disappointments, that thing you did 20 years ago that you think about every once in a while, oh, I'm so despicable, how could I do that? Jesus forgave you for that as you asked him to do that. Maybe it's five hours ago. Maybe you didn't do so good on the way to church this morning. You had all those those um, healthy family church fights in the car on the way to church, and you said something. Here's the thing. You are forgiven. Jesus did die for that. It's not true. Jesus forgives you. He died for those things, and he reappoints you. He puts new fish on the fire, and he does that for the glory of his kingdom here on earth on Mondays. Your Monday and the Mondays that you affect with other people to help others get past what they can't get past because you're getting past what you couldn't get past before that you're now getting past because you know that Jesus is taking what you offer him, and he's going to make something bigger out of it. Okay, so there's one more thing to look at in this last part of the story, this, this reappointment from disappointment. So Jesus changes analogies. Did you pick up on that? So it's been fishers of men, and he switches over to sheep. When you go fishing, I, I, I don't have the patience. You can imagine I don't have the patience because you have to, like, sit still. It just doesn't work for me to, to fish. But um, most of the time, unless you go to, a, like, a fish farm where they raise fish, fish are self-sustaining, pretty much. They just live. I had a goldfish pond in, a, in our yard for a lot of years, and I didn't feed those goldfish for years. I don't know what they ate, but they got bigger. They survived. They self-sustained, okay? He switches now. He switches to sheep because sheep are a little different. Sheep, you know, they grow wool. Their hair grows just a little slower than ours. See the gifts you get on Sunday morning? Our hair grows faster than sheep's, but it takes several years if a sheep is not sheared that their wool could be several feet long, several feet long, and weigh, because it's way thicker than ours, weigh up to 100 pounds. So that's why sheep are sheared every year, 10 to 30 pounds of wool every year. That's how much wool they grow. Sheep, the reason they need a shepherd, they're not self-sustaining. Sheep do not know how to find their own food Sheep do not know how to search for the water, especially domesticated sheep that we raise for their wool these days. So they would die, die. They would cease to live. That's what die means, if you didn't know, without a shepherd. That's what that means. If they were in the wild, they would, they would not fare so well. They, they scare easily. They just wander around. Squirrel, squirrel. They just go to whatever's over there. So they would be food for predators. That's really what it amounts to. Food for predators if they didn't have a shepherd. That's what Jesus is saying, that he wants Peter to be a shepherd. So he starts with lambs. You know what lambs are? Baby sheep. Interesting. He starts with, with baby sheep, and then he goes on to sheep. So he starts with people new in the faith, that are learning about faith in Jesus, that are learning about what being a disciple means and they're practicing. What we say a disciple is someone who learns from Jesus and lives like Jesus, so they're still learning from him so that they can live like him. Little lambs. And then he goes up to sheep, and he says, 
take care of the sheep and feed the sheep. So feed the lambs first, take care of those that are new to the faith, but continue to mature and make disciples of those. Feed and tend and feed. Feed the sheep, tend the lambs, and then feed the sheep. So Peter was commissioned, he was reappointed to do both things. So sheep are not the smartest animal in the barnyard. They're just not. They're really not very smart at all. And yet, that was one of Jesus' favorite descriptions of us as he talked about us. So what's that say? Not that we're stupid. It's not saying that he loves us. He loves us enough to be our shepherd. And he loves us enough to make us shepherds of other sheep so that then they can shepherd other sheep. The point is this, that Jesus recommissioned Peter to be a shepherd of new believers and for maturing believers, and that's the task he gives us as well. So, he ends the section with a charge to Peter in verse 19, which is, I want us to focus on, follow me. In order for you to feed and tend the sheep, Peter, follow me. To do more than get by in your life, follow me. To get past your shortcomings and all those things that you're disappointed about in you, follow me. In order to survive, to thrive and not just survive, follow me. To forgive those that have disappointed you, follow me. To forgive yourself for disappointing me or others, Jesus says, follow me. That's it. That's the formula. Follow Jesus. This reappointment from disappointment is about following the, is Jesus. We just don't do that very well. And the next verse, the last of the story, tells us exactly how we get, we get so distracted. So Jesus will invite us to re-engage the purpose. He will tweak our efforts, not dismantle them. He turns disappointment into reappointment. And then this final verse that I want to read to you, a couple of verses, he refocuses us when we get distracted. Peter turns, so they're having this great talk. Phileo love, okay, I'll take phileo love, and you're going to do something with it. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. So they got up from the fire, and they were walking. Another good way that people have conversations, especially guys. And John's walking with them. So he, the one who's also leaned back against during the supper, said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? And Peter saw him. He said, Lord, what about this man? What about John? Are you going to deal with him? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you, little Peter? What, what is that to you? Follow me. Pay it, mind your own business. Remember he called them little children, little buddy? Little buddy, follow me. Quit paying attention to those around you. So Jesus focuses us, us when we get redistracted. Sometimes I, I think that me and Peter would have got along so well. I just think I say things, I'm like, oops, shouldn't have said that. And I pay the price for it. He, so he spoke before he thought. He had an out there presence. He was a little bit of a drama king. He got super distracted by stuff. ADHD for sure. We would have got along so well. We would have talked about a thousand things at once. So Peter and Jesus are having this intimate, deep, empowering conversation. Jesus is revealing him, just follow me and be the shepherd. He's reappointing, reappointing him from a gigantic disappointment. And this little squirrel runs by. John, a squirrel runs by. I uh, read this to the message to Autumn, and she said, yep, we're all living in a squirrel world just trying to get by. Isn't it true, though? A squirrel goes by, and he's like, gets distracted, and where's the conversation they just had? After this deep talk, Peter gets distracted. And so what does Jesus do? He circles back and says, follow me. Like, give me your eyes. Follow me. And that's all he's saying to us. Follow me me. Once we get over our disappointments, whether we are the disappointed or the disappointer, we can just go back to the squirrels, to the old habits, and not follow Jesus. Jesus simply says, follow me. So we have all four of these things up here. I, we're going to take communion now. Get ready. If you haven't taken it, there's some elements back here. Get up and go get those. You can start to open that up because that can be a project. Oh, we'll take it in just a couple minutes, so just wait. You can get it ready. I was wondering how Peter did with this whole phileo agape thing, how he did with that. So I wanted to read a verse to you. It's 1 Peter 4, 8. So this is written, an epistle written by Peter, this guy, the just follow me, distracted by squirrels guy. And this is what it says. This is about Peter's growth. Above all, 
Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Above all, keep loving one another. When we disappoint each other, just keep loving each other. So here's something. What love do you think this was? Paleo love Peter. What love do you think he's saying here? It's agape love. 30 years later. I'm not saying, yeah, just take 30 years to deal with the message today. But he followed Jesus. And he was not a phileo guy anymore. He was not brotherly affection, Peter. He was agape. I love Jesus and I love people more than I even love myself. He kept following Jesus. So if Jesus asked you today, what love do you have for him? Is it phileo love? Friendship, affection for Jesus? Think about each other in this room, people in our church. What love do you have for each other? Brotherly affection, you know, like friend stuff? Or is it selfless? I'm trying to be an agape guy. I'm more of a phileo guy. So as you get ready to take your communion in a second, I want you to think about your desire for agape love. The fish that you bring to the fire of Jesus for your life, for the life of your family, for the life of people in our church, for the life of people not in our church. Will you let Will you follow Jesus enough that your phileo love, this affection for Jesus would be more than that and your affection for each other? So as you take the bread, pause for a moment and tell Jesus, Jesus, I'm sorry about the phileo thing. I want some agape love for you. Would you take all these phileo things in my life and do like you did with Peter, turn them to agape. So think about that and take the bread when you're ready. The prescription that Jesus said to Peter is to follow him. So as you take the cup, express to Jesus your desire to do that, to follow him. Take the cup. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for this message. Thank you for how much you love us, agape love. But we're sorry for phileo that we have affection for you. But it's selfish because it's what we want and what we get, what we desire from you to make our life easy, to make it fun. Jesus, help us to follow you even when it's hard. Help us when we're disappointed and you, which is even hard to admit that you are working out a plan in our life, that you already got the fire going and you're inviting us to bring what we bring to the table. Would you all remind us that your love for us, your agape love for us was not just for eternity, but it's for tomorrow. It's for when we leave here. It's for when we maneuver through the things in our life that are hard and disappointing, the relationships that are hard and disappointing, the jobs that are hard and disappointing, the feelings we have inside that are hard and disappointing, that you are here with agape love for those moments today and tomorrow, not just for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So one last thing, a practical thing. So the follow me, how do you do it? I'm gonna tell you three quick things. Pray, read your Bible, pray, read, and talk. Talk to each other. We're a fellowship of people that are trying to follow Jesus together. That's how we follow Jesus. We talk to him, we hear from him through the word, and we talk with each other as we grow. As you leave today, we hope that you had a moment. If you want to stop and get some prayer about something that you need to work on, that you're disappointed by, that you need to move past, then go back to that table. If you want to praise, have a praise to do that. And as you leave, just let go of those things that disappoint you and follow Jesus. Be blessed as you go. We'll see you next week.